Well, guys, last uh, Tuesday night, I went up to Baton Rouge with a few guys from the church to the, uh, from our church to go visit another church that was having a men's meeting. It was called the Healing Place. And while we were there, uh, Kevin Mawai was uh, the guest speaker. I didn't know that he was going to be there. I just wanted to kind of see what they were doing because we're starting our men's ministry here. And uh, Kevin Mawai stood up and he just began to share from his heart some different things that I think would really be uh, a great source of encouragement for each one of you. I'm not going to tell you all about all the things that Kevin has done. He's going to talk about his life and his career and, and different things. So I'm going to let him do the talking. This is a wonderful man, a great football player, and I would like to say a man of God. So give him a nice hand as he comes on up. Come on up, Kevin. Well, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you to Pastor Randy and, and Pastor Daryl for allowing me to come up here and uh, and just come share with you guys. Uh, you know, it, I'm... I'm not from Baton Rouge. I ended up in Baton Rouge. Uh, I, I played at LSU and, and during the Dark Ages. Do y'all know what the Dark Ages at LSU were? Do y'all remember the Dark Ages? Who was the coach during the Dark Ages? Who? Jerry, Jerry Nardo. Man, I would have died to play for that guy. It was the, the Dark Ages with who? Curly Hallman. That was, I, that's, I, that, that's the Dark Ages of LSU. So that's when I played at LSU. Um, at the LSU indoor facility, I don't know if any of you have ever been there before, but it's a lot like the Saints, but on the one those, there's this one wall there, and it starts back at early, the LSU became an institution in 1860, and they started playing intercollegiate sports sometime thereafter, and then they started hanging banners up. And you know, when you're a pretty good team, you get a banner hung up. You know, you go to the gym, and they got the banners and all that kind of stuff. So in the indoor facility, they, they had the banners from when they won the SEC title way back. And when I might say way back, the, like, Sewanee was still in the SEC. Y'all don't even know where that school is, do y'all? So one is in East Tennessee, but it's one of the original, original schools of the SEC. So, so LSU has these banners from the SEC championships in the 30s and the 40s, and then 1959 national title, and then it has the 88, you know, the 86, 87, 80 SEC championships. And then there's a blank, there's a, not a blank, there's a, there's a bank of lights, like stadium lights. And when you look up in those stadium lights, you get blinded. You're like, God, oh, yeah, I can't see anything. And then, and then the next banner is 1996. Well, when you look at when you can't see in that blind spot, that's kind of where I lived. So I was in a blind spot. But um, but they, they Pastor, you know, Pastor Darrell came to, to to Healing Place Church. I'm a member there in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I've been there since it, it, its inception, and um, and I got to speak, and and he got to hear me speak. And a couple of days later, I get an email and said, "Hey, can you come and speak to our first man up evening?" I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? I'm not doing anything. I'm unemployed and. And uh, I, I can get out of the house, a free meal means I don't have to buy dinner tonight, so, so I'm good to go. So I ended up here, and, and, um, and, and, but it is a blessing, because I, I, get, I get inspired when I get to speak to men. I get inspired when I get to challenge men. I, I, I enjoy, you know, when you, when you go speak, and they say that, that there's two things that people are most afraid of. One, and the number one fear in most people's life is public speaking. And I used to be that way. And then I started speaking, and sometimes I get paid for it, and I was like, well, this is pretty good. I can speak all day long. And, uh, but I'm not afraid to public speak, and, and, and my wife and my kids will tell you that. My kids get frustrated with me because if we're at an uh, NFL event, it takes me an hour to get from one end of the room to the other because, you well, one, people recognize you, but two, I'm the kind of guy, I don't want people to think I'm rude. So I'll stop, hey, man, what's going on? How you doing? I'll ask you where you've been, where you're from, where you're going how many kids you have, I'll ask you what you're doing, knowing that in three seconds when I turn my back, I'm going to forget everything I just asked you, but I'm going to do it because that's what I do. And um, so, so I enjoy doing this. I enjoy getting to share my story, whether it's a group of five men, 50 men, 500 men, or 1,000 men. It doesn't matter to me because I get to share what God has put in my heart, and I get to share what God has done in my life. Um, I am a husband of 21 years. So I'll be 21 in May. I met my wife my freshman year at LSU. We, date, I, we dated for six months. I broke up with her. I thought grass was greener on the other side and realized it was burnt pasture. And so I climbed the fence and uh, came back to my wife. We've been married for 21 years. We have two kids. I have a son. His name is Kirkland. He's a, uh, he's a junior. And my daughter is an eighth grader, 13-year-old. Both of them are swimmers. They don't play football. And um, it's not by, because I don't want them to. It's just his choice. And, um, and he's a great swimmer, and, and I'm proud of him. He won the state championship last year, this past fall, in the 100 back and the 100 free at the Division IV, which is a 2A, is what we, what we swim in. And um, so I'm proud of my kids. My daughter swam up as a varsity member, so she swam the 500 and 100 free 
and she placed in the state. So as an eighth grader, she lettered. So I'm, I'm proud of my little girl. And, um, and it's funny how, this is what's funny about kids. You can raise two kids in the same exact home and teach them the same exact stuff and, and tell them the same exact things and you come up without two completely different kids. And that's what I have. I have my daughter who is a yes sir, no sir, yes daddy, no daddy, yes mommy, no daddy, and does it. And then I got my son, why daddy? Why do I gotta do that? Why can't I do this? And you know, that kind of thing. And, and so he's kind of like the strong bullheaded one. And my daughter is kind of easy going. My son is, is the most athletic. My daughter is the most competitive. And so it's kind of like, well, where did these kids come from? And I, I come home and say, hey baby, where's, where's my baby girl at? And I'll say, hey honey, where's your son? <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, uh, so, so I have two kids and, um, and just have a blessed life. Just a little bit about myself beyond that. I, I played in the NFL for 16 years. I, I played at LSU. I was drafted in the second round by the Seattle Seahawks, played there for four years, went to the New York Jets, played for eight with the New York Jets, and then went to the Tennessee Titans and played four with the Tennessee Titans. I retired in 2009. I went and coached college football for one year as an intern at Vanderbilt University. I coached at an all-boys school in Tennessee for one year, and God called us to back to Baton Rouge. So I've been back in Baton Rouge now for just over a year and a half, a little over a year, and um, just kind of waiting and seeing what God has next for me. Whether it's to go into coaching or going to something else, I don't know. And for men, the hardest thing for us to do is wait and be patient, and, and that's the season I'm in my life, waiting to see what's next. And, um, and too often as men, we try to make something happen because that we, we feel like God's calling us to make things happen. But oftentimes God is just saying, hey, just hold up and, and, and I, will, I will show you what's going to happen if you just let me. Um, too often I think we make mistakes and we go out and do things without consulting God first, only to have to come back and redo them. And if you've ever been told by your dad, it's better right to do it the first time than have to come back and do it again. Um, I kind of believe in that. I've learned from the hard way that if I trust God now, then I don't have to come back and wait for God to clean up the mess that I made the first time through, only to get back to where God wanted me to be in the first place. Does that, that make sense? So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm just kind of, you know, somebody asked me what I do. I'm retired. I feel embarrassed when I talk to older gentlemen because uh, you feel bad because I'm 43. I just turned 43 a week ago. And, um, and, I, and I meet a gentleman in his 70s still working at the plant. And he goes, what do you do, son? I'm like, oh, I'm retired. <laughs> you, you know, and, and, but you really know that that guy could be retired first, but he's not because then he doesn't want to have to go home to his wife all the time. So, <laughs> but um, but I, I, this is what I do. I, I spend time with my wife. I wake up every morning, get my kids to school. I have coffee with my wife. And then uh, I make the bed. Then I have lunch with my wife. And then... I take her shopping, and then I have dinner with my wife, and then, and then I go pick my kids up, and then I come home, and I watch TV with my wife, and then we go to bed. That's kind of my life right now. And, um, and every now and then, I get to come out and speak and just kind of tell stories and, and tell you about my life. So, so that's where I'm at. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you even more detail about how I got to where I am. But what I want to talk to you tonight about it, there's this thing that God has kind of put it in my heart. It's about, it's about this, this thing, trust. And that's something that I've had to deal with. And I think the best messages that we can share with men and with people in general are messages that God is sharing in our own lives. Too often you, come, you go into, like a lot of times you go into the classroom and a teacher just teaches you stuff that she knows. And she really hasn't experienced it. She just knows it and because she studied it or because it's book smart stuff and things like that. But it's so much more interesting when you have a teacher that's teaching you about history and they lived in Rome for a year. Or, or you're, you're hearing about somebody that's teaching about politics and they were actually the mayor of the city or they ran for Senate or something like that because you, you're getting real life experience. And, and when, I, when I speak, that's what I like to speak. I want to tell you about what's going on in my life. And so that way, you don't ever have to leave here thinking, well, he knew what was on. He's just telling me. You know, he's, he's, he's pointing me out. I'm not pointing anybody out. I'm just telling you my faults. And the truth of the matter is I'm jacked up from the floor up. You know, I got issues. I have problems. Uh, my wife and I fight. I yell at my son. I've dropped a cuss word in my house a time or two. Um, I've, I've kicked my son out of the house once, <laughs> only to, to tell him, your place is at home. You need to be back in the house by 9 o'clock tonight. And, uh, and, and I, me I messed up. I, me I got problems, just like everybody else does. And I think sometimes men see a pastor on stage or somebody that has the privilege to speak to men, and, and they think that this guy's got it all together. And that's why he's got, he gets to speak to us. And, and he, he understands it. And, and 
I can never be like that, God, because you just don't know what I'm going through. But I'm here to tell you that the only reason I get to stand on this stage is because I've been through it. I'm having issues. I have a story. And I'm willing to let God work in me to be able to share what I have going on in, in here and in my heart. And hopefully, maybe if it, if it touches just one of you, then it was worth it. It was worth my ride coming down to Gretna, Louisiana from South Baton Rouge to share my story. If one man walks out of this room and said, man, I was right where that guy is at, and I know he overcame, and it's encouraging me, encouragement for me to overcome. So the, the story about trust is this, is that, and how I got this message is, is a couple weeks ago, I, I go to a Bible study on Thursday mornings in Healing Place Church, and it's a Bible study where it's all the oldest guys in the church. And I always say the oldest guys, I'm talking about it's the 70-year-olds. It's the 65, 70. And even, we have one man, man in there who's 92 years old. And I love being in that Bible study because it's wisdom. It, it, it's, set, it's separated because these are the guys that saw everything. They served in World War II. They went to Korea. These guys have been through marriages and divorces. They've been back. They've raised 15 kids. And they got 20 grandkids. And there's nothing that they haven't seen that you can't tell them, and they have a word of wisdom for you. The funny thing, I was telling this, Daryl was here the other day, I was talking about my pastor who was leading a Bible study saying, you know, you hear the same stories all the time from old men. Do y'all ever think about that? You go home and sit down with your daddy or your grandpappy or your, your papa, it's the same story he told you when you were 15. And a Bible study on Thursday morning is like that. But you sit there, you hear the same story a hundred different times, but the cool thing about it is there's a hundred different lessons. And it's kind of like the Word of God. It's kind of like the Scripture. You can see the same Scripture over and over and over again, but there's a truth to that Scripture that applies differently each time you read it. There's a reason why Jesus quotes the Old Testament. There's a reason why, why the, the Jesus quotes the prophets from the Old Scriptures and stuff like that, because it applies then and it applies now. And God's Word says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God's Word is always going to be God's Word. It's never going to change. It's always going to be the same. It could be applicable in a whole different situation. The same word you read today, the same, same promise I tell you that God has for you today might work in a whole different situation five years from now that has nothing to do with you but might have something to do with your child or your wife or your marriage or something like that. So, so this one day, um, just to kind of get you where I'm at, I've been here, I've turned down a couple of job opportunities, and my son's high school, they, they split ways with their head football coach. And so the headmaster of the school, the president of the school said, hey, this is, this is what's about to happen tomorrow. Would you be interested in, in going for the job? And it's been a year and a half now. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I, yes, I want the job. And so what I heard was this. I heard, we want you to be the head coach. Will you apply for the job? And I said, yes. Well, I get ready over the week. I put my staff together. I put all the stuff together. I'm ready. I go in the interview. I said, I want the job, but I'd like to go through the interview process just to go through the process, just so I can say that I did it, that there was, you know, that, that I earned the job, whether I'm going to get it right or not. I go to the interview. I lay it all out there. This is my plan. This is what I think. This is off-season conditioning. This is what, and they said, great. And when I been in my interview, I said, this is what I want to do. I said, I want you, if I'm not the right guy, hire the right guy for the school. My son still goes to the school. My daughter still goes to the school. I'm not a football dad. I'm a swim dad. But I will still call the games on the radio on Friday night for you guys. I, I, there's no hatred in it. it it's, it's business. And that's the one thing I learned about the NFL. It's not about rah-rah and the team colors. It's about business. And, and so when I go in for an interview, I want you to do what's best for the school, not what's best for Kevin Mawai. And I said that because that's what you're supposed to say. But in my heart, that's not what I really wanted to say. I wanted to say, I'm the guy. Just give me the job. Don't make me have to wait. And so, <laughs> so a week goes by. The day after Christmas, I get a phone call from the president. Say, Kevin, this is, you know, the, the president, whatever. And he goes, I just want to let you know that, that we had a lot of qualified candidates. Obviously, you're one of them. Um, but we have another guy. In our conversation, we felt like we needed somebody in here who has... Has, who, who has built programs before, somebody who has experience of building a program from the ground up. Well, to me, it makes sense. The team was in the playoffs last year. You don't have to build a pro program from the ground up. You just got to bring another guy in and keep it going and then build upon it. I said, okay. And he goes, but we want to give it to this guy. Neil Weiner is now the head coach at the school, and, and we would wonder if you would be considered as the offensive line coach on his staff. 
and in doing so, there would be a position on, in the school for you. Well, I'd already turned down a director of development job. I'd already turned down another job they offered me. I don't want to, you know, I thought about it for a second because I did say, well, the new coach gets hired, I'd like to be considered. Well, I sat on that, was told I didn't get the job. I wasn't too disappointed about it, but I was okay with it. Well, a week later, and all of you LSU fans know this, LSU fired their offensive line coach. Well, guess what? God was setting me up for big things. That's why I didn't get this job at Dunham, because I'm supposed to get the LSU job. And here's the thing, LSU, I get to go and redeem myself and all my teammates that played in the dark ages. I get to go back and make it right. I get to go back and play for my alma mater. I get to go back and play for, you know, and coach for LSU. I get to go, and, and I knew I could do the job. I knew in my soul that I could go in there and I could do the job. See, what a lot of people didn't know was that for the whole season last year, I was at LSU twice a week. I spent two days a week at LSU working with the defensive side of the ball, doing opponent scouting of the other, time, other team's offensive line. I would break down the entire pass protection schemes of other teams. And then I would go back and scout all the individual players and give a scouting report to the defensive lineman and say, hey, when you play against this guy, if you line up in a three technique, this is how he's going to pass at you. If you're going to attack him, he's weak on inside spin move, or you counter back with the arm over to the outside. So I would give that kind of information to the LSU's defensive lineman prior to the prior to the following. So so I was in the know. I was I was I was making connections. I was I was networking. I was being in the know, and it was so the job opened up, and I I hammered Cam Cameron, I nailed him. Phone messages, text messages, and say I want the job. I want the. I called Bill Parcells. I called Herm Edwards. I called Jeff Fisher. Hey, will you be my resource? Will you be my reference for me? Yeah, I'll do that. I'll, every office line. And I'm, uh, so there's this waiting period where you got to trust. Because you don't know if you're going to get the job. You don't know if they think they're going to take you seriously. But you got to trust that God's got a plan for you. And eventually, 22 days later, I got a call back said, hey, you got an interview scheduled for this day. So Sunday morning, I went in and had my interview. And it, wasn't I went in and it was a five-hour interview. I'm on the board, I'm chalk talking, and I'm sitting drawing circles and triangles and squares and blitz packages, reading coverages, and I blew it out the door. And you know when things are going right, you know, you're in business or and you're, you're, you're trying to get something done, and you just know you're clicking. And that's the way I was. And, and it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Well, prior to that, wanting to go get that interview, I was asked to go to Angola to go speak at the men's sports conference that night. And I didn't know what I wanted to speak about, and it was because I wanted the job at LSU. So my question to the pastor on the ride up from Baton Rouge to Angola was, was, was Pastor, I, I don't know what to talk about. I don't have a message. I don't know what to speak to these inmates about. I was more worried about whether I'm going to get jumped down the hallway or I need to take a buddy into the bathroom with me and take out my ring and wallet and stuff so I don't get, you know, so I don't get, I've never been in prison before. I mean, I'm going to, am I going to come out? Am I going to get a shank in my left kidney? Or I didn't know. So, so the one word that God put in my heart was trust. And so on that 30, 45 minute ride from Baton Rouge to Angola, God could reveal some scriptures to me. And it said trust. And, and so, and so that's what I wanted to talk to you guys tonight about the word trust and what does that mean. And I'm going to kind of finish up that LSU story after this is this, is that there's different kinds of trust that we have in our lives as men. And there's different reasons and different levels and things like that. Like, like for instance, if you're in business and you have a business partner, you got to trust that guy, right? You got to trust that, that guy, that you guys are walking lockstep with one another, that you guys are working for the good of the business. And that you got to trust that he's going to do the business of the business and not do the business for himself. And you got to trust that when it comes time to do the business, you can't be in the business with him in the meetings with him, that he's going to speak for you on behalf of the business and not on behalf of himself. And that's kind of a trust that you just got to develop. It's a business trust, a trust that, that, that you just don't know. And sometimes you just can't feel it. You just, you just know you can trust the guy. You just know you can't. Have you ever been around that guy? He, he fast talks to you and you're like, yeah, I just don't know if I can trust that guy. And, and, and that's, that's a kind of a level of trust there. There's this level of trust that you have with your wife. And for those many of them married, or, or you're, you know, there's, there's this trust that you have that with everything. You tr like, I trust my wife with everything. There's not a secret between me and my wife. She, there's nothing that's going on in my life that my wife doesn't know about. There's nothing that, that's going on in her life that I don't know about. I know about her wrongs that were done when she was a kid. I, remember, I know about the things that happened before we got married. She knows about the, the, the things that I did before I was... 
there's a trust that we have that is like no other trust. It's a trust that, that, that I know that my wife is doing what's best for me. It's a trust that I know that I know that she's doing what's best for my kids. There's a trust that she knows that what I'm trying to do is what's best for our family. And there's a trust that, that we have for each other that we know that we would never do anything to hurt one another or hurt our children. And that's a level of trust that, that, that because you don't have it, there are broken marriages all over this country because of it. And then there's this trust that you have with your daughter that when you say, baby, is there something wrong with you? And she boils up in tears and she tells you, yeah, daddy, and this is what happened at school. There's a trust that she gives you because she knows that you know that she, you got her, that you're her baby, that she's your baby and you're gonna take care of the business. And there's a trust that some punk kid comes up on my daughter. Guess what? That punk kid ain't going to walk out of my house. You know? So, and she knows that. She knows that daddy's got her back. There's this trust that when, when your kid is like this high, and he, he's looking down off this ledge, and it looks like a mountain to him. And he's standing up there, daddy, daddy, can I jump? Y'all remember this with your kids? And you're sitting here like this, come, come on, man, I got you. Right? And, and I'm, I got you. And the kid wants to jump, and you let him jump. And, and, you, know, and you try to be that cool dad because you, you are, oh, right? You let, but, you, but it's such a thrill, but he knows that, that you got him. And there's that trust that, that your kids have for you that they trust that even though they don't trust you as a parent, there's a trust inside of them that they know they, they can trust you with everything, that you're not going to let them hurt themselves. They trust you that you're not going to let them do something destructive to their own lives. They trust that you have what's best of even though... They tell you they don't trust you because you snooped into their bedroom or because you got the password for their, their iPad or because you've read their journal once or twice just because you thought something was up in their life and they weren't sharing with you. But there's a trust that a father and a son has or a daughter and a child, a daughter and a son, and, and that's another kind of trust. So this word trust just keeps coming back to me. And, and then there's this trust that for men, for whatever reason, are so afraid to give it because of something in their lives that either one, they've been told it's not manly to do it, or because something happened in their lives when they thought somebody had their back and they didn't. But there's this trust that you gotta have in God. That God says, trust me, I know where you've been. And God says, trust me, because I know where you're going. And God says, trust me, because I know the stumbling blocks that you've been placed in front of you. God says, trust me, because I know the addictions that you've dealt with. God says, trust me because I love you. And for men, that's such a hard thing to do because we're, we're men. Society says as men, we're supposed to bow up and take care of business. As society's men says, we're not supposed to cry when we hurt. We're not supposed to show fear. We're not supposed to do, we're not supposed to show weakness. You know, we're not supposed to, we're, we're not supposed to show, you know, the, the, we're not supposed to show faults in our, in our system. We're not supposed to show cracks in our armor. And, and God's saying, trust me. And too often, men, we don't want to trust God because we think we got it under control. We think we got it figured out. And I can tell you this right now, that, that, that I trust God even if I don't know what God has for me. And that's a hard thing to do. Because as I'm driving up to Angola that night, I went for the job. I got a call on Friday night and said that, 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 that you got an interview, come in on Sunday. I nailed, the, I nailed it. I nailed it. And when you ask me, when, when we're sitting there talking about offensive line play and, and Coach Miles, and it's just me, Coach Miles, and Cam Cameron, and he's asking me, how would you teach how to get in a stance? Well, you know, this is how we talk about the stance, getting, you know, sit like you're sitting on a log, get a stagger stance. If you're on the right hand side, put your right hand down, your left hand side, put your left hand side down. You know, six inches, your splits are two and a half feet apart. If you change it on the place, if you go outside zone, cut your splits down. If you're inside zone, widen them out, give you some natural running lanes. I mean, I'm, I'm humming. And this is football language now. Some of you guys don't understand that. That's okay. But this is how, I mean, it was, it was like magic. And for a moment, I felt like the days I did when I was on the football field, that, that I was humming. And when I say humming, I'm talking about on the football field, this, the center calls all the plays. And the quarterback's got to, not a play, he calls protections and stuff like that. The quarterback's got to trust that I'm doing my job. The, the rest of the O-linemen got to trust that I see what I see. And you got a matter of like three seconds or maybe four seconds to figure it all out. 
You come out of the huddle. The first thing you're sitting there, you're in the huddle watching, you listen to your quarterback, but you got an eye on the sideline over there, and you're watching players coming in and out. I see a 32 coming in. I see a 54 going out. That tells me they're going in the nickel package. Now I got two, I got two linebackers and four DB, five DBs on the field. You know, you're watching that kind of stuff, and you break the huddle. You know, it's whatever, it's two jet on one ready to break. But two jet tells me we're slide protection. First thing I do is look at the back of the backfield. There's two high free safeties. I know they're in zone coverage. There's one that's going to be a man coverage. If they're in one man coverage, they got one high safety. I know they're in one man coverage. I got to find another safety. If he's down to the right, they're probably going to be pressure off the right. If he slides down to the left, I know there's a chance they can dog off the side. They bring the safety, they bring the linebacker, drop off the defensive end. So now I got direct pass protection that way. But first, I got to find the mic backer. The free safety is here, the mic backer's there. The mic's right here, and that means the back's got him, the back's got him. I got this guy to that guy. But if they drop the safety down on the other side, they're going to shift the linebackers this way. Now the mic's over here and here. Now I got this guy, this guy, and that guy. And if Pedro comes out of the stands, we've got to block Pedro, too. Uh, and we call him Pedro because my high school kids, my coach, and I said, who's the drunk guy that's in the stands? Well, let's call him Pedro. I was like, all right, well, if Pedro comes out of the stands, he's our responsibility. So, so I mean, and that's how quick, the way I'm telling you, that's how quick I was in my, my, my interview. And there was nothing. And then they got to the recruiting. And this was the big deal. He's never recruited before. How can you go on the road and, and get a guy when you've never been on the road to recruit before? I had this, I was baffled. Recruiting is not hard. First of all, I'm going into your room, into your house, all right? Kevin Mawai has just been hired as your offensive line coach. Your son plays offensive line. Hi, I'm Coach Mawai, 16-year NFL vet. I've been two Hall of Fames. I'm in LSU's two Hall of Fames. And I can tell you how to get to the NFL and show you how to do it real well. Come play for me. Who wouldn't want their son to play for a guy like that? And I'm not saying that because, but I'm saying that's what you do. It's about relationships. It's about building relationships. And I nailed the interview. And I get a phone call two days later that says, hey, Kevin. <laughs> he goes, what I want you to do, he goes, if I can get two guys, you would be my number two guy. He goes, I need a guy that has experience of putting players into the NFL. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You're going to go hire a guy that wasn't good enough to play in the NFL, so he had to go coach it over a guy that knows what it takes to play in the NFL and did it for 16 years. So while this guy was building his coaching resume up, I was doing what he was trying to coach everybody else to do. And he was showing him my game film to do it. Are you, are you serious? And I, so it blew me away. And he goes, it would be great if you go to a smaller college, get on the road, get some experience coming in at 545 in the morning, working out with the kids and stuff like that, and then come back. And then you I said, oh, time out, coach. Here's the deal. I am from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I have a home here. I'm about to break ground on my brand new house. Oh, by the way, it's the dream house that I've ever, I always wanted to live in. I live 15 minutes from campus. I have two teenagers that God has called me to be with them at this time in my life. I am not going to Jones Junior College to get recruiting experience. And if you think that's what I need to get back to LSU, guess what, Coach? I guess I'm never going to be good enough for you. And you want to know how hard that was? Because I felt in the bottom of my soul that this is what God had for me. That God has called me to come back home to coach at my alma mater to be an LSU football coach because this is where God wanted me. And it wasn't. And I was crushed, devastated, disappointed, hurt because for the first time that I've left the game, I wanted to be back in it so badly. And I thought this was the plan God had for my life, and it wasn't. And then the word trust hit me. That message that I shared with those men on Wednesday night in Angola was never for those men in the first place. It was for me. Because God was telling me, Kevin, I know the plans you have in your heart, but I'm going to determine the steps that you take. Proverbs 16, 9. In this heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines the steps. Trust in me, Kevin. Proverbs 16, 9, first scripture I ever remember says, commit to the Lord all that you do and your plans will succeed. I think for a moment, and I have, in retrospect now, I have had over two or three weeks to think about this, the plan that I had for LSU was never about God. It was about filling something for me because it was about Kevin Mawai going back to being an LSU football coach again. 
And so the word trust kept sitting in here, trust. What does it mean to trust? Does it mean to trust him with everything? Yeah, everything. Your finances, your job, your family. My son and I don't see the eye and eye. And it's a relationship that's been strained for two or three years now. And it hurts me. It crushes me that my son and I can't have a conversation that lasts more than two sentences without an explosion taking place between me and him. It crushes my spirit. And God, through that, says, trust me. Trust me. The word says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is older, he won't depart from it. We get caught up in that when he's, he will not depart from it. We say, train up a child in the way he goes, he won't depart from it. But the Bible says, says when he gets older. My son is in that moment in his life where he's trying to figure this whole thing out for himself. And I want him to trust me, but more importantly, I want him to trust God. And I'm trying to learn that God wants me to trust him with my son's life. And that's a hard thing to do, but I do know this, that God is faithful and God is true. And God's word is never laid bare. God's word is his word. And God promised me, promises me, that the foundation that my son will fall on when he hits his bottom is going to be the foundation of Jesus Christ. Because that's what the truth is. And that's where my trust lies. And then the scripture that God led me to is this, and there's two of them. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit or acknowledge, to, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. God says, with everything that you got, trust in me with all your heart. Not just most of your stuff, not just some of, with everything. And the word that, in, this, in this version was submit. And that's a word we don't like to hear as men. We don't want to submit. I'm not bowing down to you. And that's what my son said. Why do I got to listen to you? Because God put me in charge of you. If you don't submit to me, you're, God's going to make you submit to him one way or another. But as men, we don't want to submit. That's weak. We want to man up, take charge. But God says, submit. Submit all your ways to me, and I will make your path straight. It might not be the vision you had, but at the end of the day, the, 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 the picture that I paint is so much more beautiful than the one that you can paint for yourself. And God says, submit to me. That's Proverbs 3, 5. And, and, and it, what the word submit means, it means give over. Give over to somebody. As your business partner, and sometimes you got to sign a power of attorney over to your business partner, right? And you got to sign that over and say, I'm giving you authority to do my bidding. My wife and I have moved several times. There's been times where I've been in training camp and she's had to close on a house. You know, when I was in Tennessee, she was in New York. And I had to sign over a power of attorney the power of authority for my wife to sign my name that says that we are one, that my wife has the authority to take over the business of our family to make the decision and give it to her. Give over, seed, give away. Open your hands up and let it go. And God is saying, do the same thing. Sign your life over to me. Sign everything you got to me, and I will take care of you. I promise you I will. But you got to trust me. You got to trust me. The scripture in, in Psalms 37, it's 37 verses 3 through 6. And I'm going to read this to you and I'm going to talk to you about it. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous rewards shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. How amazing is that? Because there's only four words that really stand out in that. The first one is the word trust. And we've talked about the different kinds of trust and levels of trust and stuff like that. But the, the first word in that is trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord and, delight, and, and trust in the Lord and do good. The second word is this is dwell. And, and I, I, yeah, I had to look these things up before I spoke last week and the same message because it's sitting in my heart. The word dwell says to linger over, to emphasize, to ponder and thought, to remain motionless. And as men, we want to do this number. We want to go. We want to get busy. We want the next deal. We want to go on to the next business of the day. We want to accomplish stuff. I'm a checklist guy. I want to take a notepad and put my things, 10 things on the list that I got to get accomplished today. And I, want, and I don't go from one to five, back up to three. I'm one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's the way I work. I work that way. As a football player, you don't go, I mean, you do. You start on, like, say, 20, and you go to 25, back to 19, back to 30. But at the end of the day, you're going forward. 
My whole life has been setting that I am going forward. There's a goal line at the end of the wall, at the end of the field, and I'm supposed to cross it. And if I have a list of 10 things to do, and I knock those all out, when I hit number 10, I cross the goal line. I've accomplished it. And we want to be on the move as men. We want to be going and doing, and we want to be shaking things up, and we want to score the next deal, and, and we want to get our hustle on and stuff like that. And sometimes God is saying, stop, dwell, remain motionless. And that's, the, that's the where I'm at right now in my life. There's so much of me that wants to get up and go. I want to go coach in the NFL or college football and things like that. And, and, and I know that's what I want to do at one time in my life. But God is saying, whoa, pump the brakes, big boy. Pump them. Slow down a little bit. Because right now, Kevin, I want you to stay right where you're at. I want you to dwell in me. I want you to dwell in the situation I have you in. And maybe, and just maybe, you dwelling in that situation gives you an opportunity to spend more time with your kids and spend more time with your wife and spend more time in developing that relationship. And you know what? A couple of days ago, my son and I, we finally sat down and we had a conversation where we didn't kill each other. And we kind of hashed some things out. Had I gotten the job at LSU, I would have been on the road for three weeks. I wouldn't have saw my son, and our problems would have festered. And you have these things that go on in your life, and they hurt so bad that you ask God, why? This is not how I envisioned it. And I had to ask my wife, why does my son hate me so much? And my son heard those words come out of my mouth. And I probably said some things that hurt him too. But that night, my son came out of the room. While I was crying in my chair, sat on the arm of the chair, put his arms around me, and said, Dad, I don't, I don't hate you. I love you. And I said, Kirkland, you don't show it. I need you to show it. And we talked about the five love languages. And then he expressed to me how, he's, how he gets love and how he likes to show love. And I showed with him how I need to know how I'm loved. And do you know my son, the last three days, has hugged me. I've counted them. He's hugged me four times each day in the last three days. And had I been so busy to go and do instead of dwelling where God has me, that moment never would have taken place. In four days, my relationship with my son has been better than it has been in the last two years. And I believe it's because I have answered God's call to just stay and dwell. The word dwell. The next word is delight. Have great pleasure. Delight. Man, I, I delight in my wife. I hope to delight in my wife when my kids are at school tomorrow. That's a joke for you married guys. But I love the wife of my youth. I love being around her. I enjoy being with her. Most of the time, I don't like going to TJ Maxx, but I'll drive her there just so I can be with her. I delight in her. I delight in when my kids succeed. I delight when I saw my son touch the wall and win the state championship. I delight on the football field? Are you kidding me? People want to know what it's like on the football field. And, 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 and we're, I got delight in the football field, but it wasn't the game itself, and I talked about this the other day. It's not the game. It's not the hitting and tackling. That hurts. I mean, that hurts. What I delighted in was the five seconds before I took the field. Not, like, not before kickoff, but like in the tunnel. The five seconds before you come out of the tunnel. Because that's the moment. When you're a kid in the NFL 
and you see the confetti and the fireworks and you see the guys in the huddle and in the tunnel and you, they're doing this number. And that's what the NFL was all about. And for 241 games, I got to experience that and I delighted in it. And as I got older and became a Christian, I delighted in being greater because I knew God put me there. And everybody has this song that they play that gets them jacked up. And I talked about Friday nights, it was Phil Collins in the air. And, you know, I can feel it come. And you know, and you're listening to it, and everybody's waiting. What am I waiting for? Everybody played the drums on Friday night, whether you knew how to play music or not, because it was that's what you waited for. My song in the huddle in the tunnel was it was Freddie Hammond. Freddie Hammond, Radical for Christ Jesus Cryer. When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will dance like David danced. I start dancing, bump. When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I'll sing like David sang. And I, I'm pumping up, and I'm getting excited, and this is my moment, and God has placed me here. That's where I delighted in football, because that was my moment. And that's the song I played in the back. I sang it over and over and over. And then I'll, you know, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I'll pray like David, I will sing, I will sing. And all of a sudden, and introducing the sinner from LSU, Kevin Moore, woo, that was the moment. And I run out to do, and, and then we're going to go play. The football part was easy, but there was the delight in that moment. God says, trust in me with everything. Trust. And then he says, dwell. That means stay, stay motionless and remain motionless and stay right where God has you. And sometimes we don't want to do that as men. That's the hardest thing to do is to be patient where God has you. And then he says, delight. Delight in me. Delight in me. Delight in the things that you do, but to understand that I gave you those things. And every time I stepped foot on the field, I knew that God gave me another opportunity. And I delighted in that. And that's why that was my song. And when I became a football coach, I sat in the tunnel, walked down the street with the kids in front of them, and in my, as a high school coach, I'm singing the same song because it was that moment that God has given me an opportunity to delight in him. God says, trust, dwell, delight. And the last word is commit. Commit. Commit in your, your way to the Lord. Is what you're doing for him or is it for you? Are you committing it to your success or to increase the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Are you committing it because you want to be the guy on the pedestal or because you want to put him on the pedestal? And God says, commit. And when you do all these things, not just do one of those, when you do these things, then I will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. And here's the thing, I go back to the work. I didn't get the LSU job. But I trust God, and God's got something bigger for me. Do you understand that? We think about the things that we don't have, not understanding that God's got, maybe you don't have that because that's too small. Maybe that God's something, something much bigger than you. Maybe it's, that's not the job that he has for you because he knows you're better than that or because he knows you have more to offer or because, maybe it's because, because that platform's not big enough for the kingdom. The people of Israel were promised a land flowing with milk and honey. When they got to the River Jordan, they looked over, they sent people out to scout the land, and they came back, and they told about how great everything was, yeah, 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 but there's this big city in the middle that we got to get through to get to that city. That city was Jericho. Jericho was significant during that time because you had to get to Jericho to get to the promised land. And there were too many people that worried about the city and didn't focus on what was the promise. And they were scared because they had to go through the city. It was the greatest fortified city at the time that you had to get through to get to the promised land. And sometimes, me not getting the LSU job, or you not having something happen to you, sometimes you get so focused on the Jericho that you don't see the promise. And God is calling us to tear down the walls of Jericho so that we can build a platform for him instead of building walls against him so that we can get into the promised land and have all that he has for us. And I've learned in the last month that maybe God doesn't have that job at LSU for me because maybe he's got something bigger for me, an opportunity. And within that time, that, that spirit put that in me, I got to speak at Hilly Place Church not once, but twice. And I'm speaking here today. Just got off the phone on the way up here that I'm speaking at a conference in Manny, Louisiana to coaches from three-state area, tri-state area. 
The platform continues to get bigger if you allow God to do the work and not try to dwell on what you want to do, but dwell on what God wants you to do. And that's the promise God has for you. Trust in him, delight in him, dwell in him, and commit everything to him. And here's the thing. You can look at me and say, Kevin, that's easy for you. You played in the NFL for 16 years. You've got the finances that it's okay if you didn't get that job because because you can afford not to have another job. And that's true. And a matter of fact, that was one of the things that came up in the interview. I was told that my concern is this, Kevin, is that you have the wherewithal that you don't have to have this job. And if you don't like the hours, you can just leave. Because I want to be here. You don't have to pay me to be here. I came here last year for free. I ain't going to do it again. (laughs) I ain't going to do it again. But... I want to do this. But God spoke to me and said, this is not what I want you to do yet. It's not now, it's maybe yet. And so, yeah, that's right. So I've had all the success. But this is, let's rewind back to the beginning of my talk and, and let's know who I really am. I am the second boy of a military sergeant. My dad is born and raised in Hawaii, left Hawaii to join the army to get off the rock. It's the only way he can afford to get off the island. Volunteered to go to Vietnam, served two tours, decided the military was his life. 23 years in the Army. During that 23 years, he moved around from state to state, met my mom when his family left Hawaii to my mom's home state. They got married before my dad's second term, second tour to Nam. He came back, they moved to Germany, had my brother. A year later, they moved to Savannah, Georgia, that's where I was born, Hunter Army of Airfield. Six months after I was born, my dad got shipped to Korea. So my mom and my dad, my mom and brother and I moved back to Washington to go live with our grandparents. My dad came back. He recruited in Washington for a year, and then we got stationed in Fort Riley, Kansas. Two younger brothers were born there. Then five years after there, we got shipped back to Germany. So we lived in Germany for five years, and guess what? Fort Polk chose us, and we came to Fort Polk, Louisiana, because people don't choose Fort Polk in the Army. (laughs) Why would you go to Fort Polk? And my mom, my dad came down with orders, and I remember this, like yesterday, my mom's like, do we go to Fort Lewis? Because that's where, you know, that Washington, do we get Schofield Barracks in Hawaii? And my dad's like, no, we're going to Fort Polk, Louisiana. Oh, oh my God, I can't believe where you're taking me. And so we fly from Germany, we spend the Washington, we spend the summer in, on the East Coast, and then we drive down about to Louisiana, we come through Baton Rouge, and then the next thing you hit, 20, about 30 miles outside of Baton Rouge is what? Chaffly Basin Swampway, right? Swamp. For 20 miles. Oh my God, where are we at? <laughs> my mom, it was horrible. Why do you, we ended up in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Fort Polk, Louisiana, and I, and I had the privilege of playing for Leesville High School Wampus Cats. We were a powerhouse team back in the day. We went to the state playoffs every year, putting guys into the, in, into, into the college football left and right. My high school, in my high school, we have nine guys that have played in the NFL. And that's how good Leesville was. And it, it, it's not as good now, but that's how, we, how good we were. Eddie Fuller, touchdown Eddie, came from Leesville High School. His brother, Vincent Fuller, Raymond Smoot. Those guys were three, a year behind me and four, I mean, a year ahead of me and then three years ahead of me. I naturally followed LSU because of my teammates. Got a scholarship to go to LSU. I hate to say it, but I really wanted to go to Alabama. <laughs> it kills me to say that. Kills me to say that. Kills me. But when you live in Germany, you only have one channel. It's an armed forces network. And the only kind you all got to see the Big Ten play, and that was it. And you got to see Alabama and Penn State every year. And that's all, it's all I like the two colors because they're the plainest uniforms of college football. I, all these stripes and camo and all that, you can throw that, put a match to it. Give me one color and an offset in color, and I'm good to go. And so Alabama's team I want. I, I learned to hate L- Alabama very quickly. And so I went to LSU, and I, I got to play at LSU, and and I came there under Mike Archer in 89, played for him in 90. That's where I started starting. And then Curly Holman came in, and then dark history, whatever. I made it out in spite of Curly Holman. <laughs> and, 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 then, and then I got drafted to the NFL. And then two years later, uh, May 5th, 1996, I got a phone call. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. 
over and over and over again. He's dead. My younger brother Scott was calling me to tell me that my older brother John had just been killed in a car accident. He's dead. John was a year older than I am. Iris twins, whatever, a year and five days apart. We lived in a military housing, which is not big houses. We shared the same bedroom our entire life. Shared clothes, had the same friends. I went to LSU. He transferred to LSU, became my teammate, became my roommate, was my best man in my wedding, was my best friend. Two years into my NFL career, I get a phone call from my younger brother telling me that our brother had been killed in a car accident on his way back from a celebratory trip from New Orleans, Louisiana to Baton Rouge. He had just gotten hired as a defense line coach at, Santa, at East Ascension High School in Gonzales, and he came down here to celebrate with a guy in New Orleans, and then never made it back. And I was humming in the NFL. I made the all-rookie team, started as a second-year player, first-year player, was killing it. Was fast and rapidly developing my reputation as one of the dirtiest players in the NFL. And I get a phone call that says my brother was killed in a car accident. I didn't know who God was. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't grow up reading the Bible. I didn't know. I thought, you know, this guy Jesus, uh, Christmas, hey, Easter, the holidays to me. Two months after my brother was killed in a car accident, my wife informed me that she was pregnant with our first child. Crushed and devastated, and now I'm confused. Because I knew that there's this God, I didn't know anything about him, but I felt that God, there's a God that kind of oversaw everything. He's kind of like the gatekeeper kind of guy. But I didn't understand who God really was. And now I'm questioning, who was this God that was strong enough, powerful enough, mighty enough to, to take my brother's life away, but then in a the blink of an eye, turn around and say, you're going to have the best blessing you've ever had and give me a son. And I was confused. I didn't know where to go. And I played in the Senior Bowl, the Blue, excuse me, the Blue Bay All-Star game, and in that game, it, it coming out of college, they gave me a Bible and it had my name on it. Never took it out of the box. Three years later, after that game, I got the phone call. I opened the Bible for the first time in my life. And I didn't know where to start. I just kind of heard about this, the New Testament. So I looked at the New Testament. And it had this book called Matthew. So I started reading the book of Matthew. And then I was like, well, that was a pretty interesting book. This guy, Jesus, is pretty cool. He did some really neat things. Makes a good movie. And then I started, I started reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, and on and on and on. And before I knew it, I completed the entire New Testament. And so now I found out about this guy, Jesus, and what he did for us and how he gave his life over for me and my sins and, and for the promises that he makes. I want to know how he got to be who he was. So I went all the way back to the beginning. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And I went all the way through the New Testament, Old Testament. And before I read the entire Bible. Next thing I knew, we're hosting Bible study in my house. I'm not even a saved guy yet. I'm still a heathen. I'm, I'm hosting Bible studies. Not teaching them, hosting them. <laughs> I wasn't ready to teach them. <laughs> and, and I remember before I got saved, our Bible study teachers asked me, and we were a couple study, and I had questions because it was now almost a year after my brother's death. And all, everything was why, 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 why this, why that, why? And she asked me, Kevin, have you accepted Christ yet? I said, no, but I'm working on it. We come back to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and we were going to church. We, we made a commitment when we had our son that we'd start going to church. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what it means to raise a kid in church. And we started going to Healing Place Church. At the time, it was called Trinity Christian Center. And the guy that was a the pastor there happened to be the guy that married my wife and I when we were in college, when I knew nothing about the church, nothing about the Bible. And he was preaching one day, and I was sitting to the back of the room. If this is a stage, I was sitting back to the left, uh, I was back to the right. And he's preaching, he's going, and he looks up, and we catch eyes with each other, and he hesitates in the moment, in the middle of a sermon. He looks, and he kind of like 
shocks him a little bit and goes on about service. Afterwards, we go up to him, hey, Dino, remember us? You married us two years ago, three years ago. Yeah, hey, how you doing? You know, what's going on? I said, man, I just need to talk to you. I got some questions to ask you. All right, let's get together. Well, it didn't happen. The next week we were in church, I'm sitting in the same place. He's up here preaching, and the same thing happens. He looks up, and it's a double shock because now I'm in church two times. And he, whoa, hey, and God said this, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I came, he came up to me, hey, good seeing you guys in church again. I'm glad you can make it for the second week. I said, Dina, look, man, you and I don't know each other. I said, but I got some serious questions I need to ask you. I said, I really need to, I really need to meet with you. So we made plans to meet. And he explained all these theological questions for me, but there's one question I kept waiting for. And then I was waiting for the big question. And the question was, why? Why did God take my brother? And he told me this, and I remember like it was yesterday, I was sitting across the table from him in the youth ministry room. He says, Kevin, you don't lack a knowledge of who Christ is. You don't lack knowledge of who he is and what he's done. You don't lack a knowledge of who God is. What you lack is faith and trust in what he can do in your life. Would you like to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior today? And I broke down and wept. June 24th, 1997, I was born again. Never looked back on those days. And now I know why. I know that God will take one person and take his life to change multitudes. He gave his son up for me and for you. He gave his son up on the cross, the worst death that anybody can imagine, to save us from our sins. For those then, at the time, and in the future, which includes all of us. And the greatest lesson I learned in all of that was this. If God trusted his son enough to give his son up, why can't I trust him enough for him to take my brother? By him taking my brother, my life changed. I became a born-again Christian. In that process, my wife recommitted her life to Christ. My two kids got saved at an early age and were baptized before the age of 10. The successes that I had on the football field are no coincidences in heaven. The greatest successes I had on the football field were after the days I got saved. Because God said, trust me, and I did. And when I did, my platform became bigger. I went from a small media market to the largest media market in the world and played in New York City. For six of those years, I played with a cross on my face mask. Not for everybody else, but as a reminder to me of what God was able to do through me. The platform has continued to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. There are times there where I don't want to trust God, but I'm called and commanded to. There are times there where I want to go and God calls stay. There are times there where I ask God why and I get so mad at God and I'm reminded that we're called to delight in Him. But never was there a time where I ever thought I could do it better than him, and I've committed everything to him. My career, my kids, my relationships, my family, the platform that he's given me. Because here's the thing, as successful men, you can take every accolade that you ever get and stack them up on top of each other and continue to make the pedestal greater and greater for yourself. And every trophy you get, every all pro, every best salesman of the year, and that's another brick that you can add to your pedestal. Or, instead of stacking them on top of each other, you lay them out like a sidewalk. And now, what was once this high is now this wide. Instead of me looking down on everybody, I can look eye to eye with the man and say, I've been there. I've lost a brother. Hey man, I know what it is to lose $100,000. I really don't, but uh, you know what I mean? But I know what it's like. I know what it's like to fail, because I've been there. Because you see this, the platform gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And when you're in settings like this, the man up dinner, everybody wants to man up and show how macho you are. But what manning up really means is getting down on the floor with them. I said, dude, I understand. Hey man, I lost a brother. I know what that means. 
You know what? I argued with my wife last night and I was wrong. So I understand where you're coming from. Because see, my platform has just gotten so much bigger because I get to be on the same floor with you guys. I'm not a football player. You know what? I'm just a man of God that God chooses to use, but who I've allowed to God to use to be a voice for him. Because God has given us each a platform. It might be in the oil fields. It might be on the river. It might be in the chemical plants. It might be in a football field. But we all have a story. And we all have a platform to use. And you choose the bricks and how they're going to be used. Do you use them to build yourself up, to make yourself better than the men around you? Or do you use them to build a platform to reach out and touch more people in your lives? And that's what I've chosen to do. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we come to you right now, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I thank you for the grace and the mercy that you've had in our lives. Lord, I thank you for the truth that you continue to hit me home with, hit home with me. The words that I share with these men were for me and not for anybody in this room in particular. But Lord, if it touched somebody, I say thank you. I pray that you would just work in their hearts. I pray for this church, Lord, Believer's Life Church, that we continue to reach out for this community, that it will continue to touch people in the greater New Orleans area. I thank you for, for Pastor Randy and Daryl and what they're doing. And Lord, I thank you for these men in this room for taking their time out of their lives, away from their kids, away from their wives, to just come and, and share and, and fellowship with one another. Lord, I thank you for their patience with my time and my words. And Lord, I just uh, I thank you for who you are. But Lord, we thank you for what you gave up for us. You allowed your son to die on the cross for our sins, Father, so that whoever believed in him would have eternal life. So, Lord, I just uh, I thank you for that. I'm humbled by the opportunities that you've given me. I thank you for the platform that you continue to allow me to have. And, Lord, I pray that I never abuse it and that I never take it for granted. Lord, be with each and every one of these men tonight as they go back home to their friends and their families. Lord God, that you touch them, use them to make a difference in the lives of those around them. Lord, may you bless them and may you be with them in all that they do and everywhere they go in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.